Hello, everyone. My name is Anna O'Sullivan, the director of the Butler Gallery, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. On behalf of the Butler Gallery, in partnership with Kilkenny Arts Festival, we are delighted to present the Irish premiere of two acclaimed installations by Kilkenny-born artist Richard Moss as part of Brightening Air, a nationwide 10-day season of arts experiences brought to you by the Arts Council. Incoming will be exhibited at the Butler Gallery until the 29th of August and Grid Moria will run outdoors from June 11th to June 20th. Thank you for joining us for this In Conversation series where today we bring together Richard Moss with Sean O'Hagan for a discussion about Richard's work and the making of Incoming. Let me share with you a little of both of their impressive bios. Richard Moss was born in 1980 and lives and works in New York and Ireland. His first major survey exhibition, Displaced, is currently on show at Mast Foundation, Bologna. His work has been the subject of recent solo exhibitions at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., Barbican Art Gallery in London, and the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne. Moss represented Ireland at the 55th Venice, Biennale, uh, Venice Art Biennale, for which I was involved as curator commissioner. He is a recipient of the Prix Picte, the world's leading award for photography, and the Deutsche Borsa Photography Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Shifting Foundation grant, the Yale Pointner Fellowship in Journalism, the Frankfurt Biennale B3 Award, a grant from the Via Art Production Fund, Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, the Lenore Annenberg Fellowship, and is an honorary fellow of the Royal Photo Photographic Society. Moss has published seven books. His latest monograph, The Castle, published by Mac, was selected as one of the New York Times Magazine top 10 photo books of 2018. Moss earned an MFA in photography from Yale University, a postgraduate diploma in fine art from Goldsmiths London, and a Master of Research degree in Cultural Studies from the London Consortium, and a first class BA Honours degree in English Literature from King's College London. Sean O'Hagan is photography critic for The Guardian and a general feature writer for The Observer. He grew up in Armagh in Northern Ireland and has since lived in Paris, Dublin and London, where he now resides. He has interviewed many of the world's leading photographers, including Nan Golden, William Eggleston, Stephen Shore, Joseph Kudelka, Cindy Sherman and the late Robert Frank. In 2011, he was awarded the J. Dudley Johnston Medal by the Royal Society of Photography for sustained excellence in the field of photographic criticism. He has contributed essays to several photo books and catalogues, including Everything Was Moving, Photogra Photography from the 60s and 70s, Malik Sidebe, The Eye of Modern Mali, Caspian, The Elements by Chloe Dew Matthews, and Ex Photo by Alice Tomlinson. It's my great pleasure to now pass you on to Richard and Sean, who will talk for up to an hour, uh, maybe less, and I will return just before that to sign off. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Well, it's good to catch up here, Richard. It's been a while. And yeah. um, a lot of water under the bridge since we last talked, <laughs> to say the least. Um, so we're going to talk today, I guess, mainly about Incoming and Maria, and they're being exhibited together, which suggests that you see them as part of a whole. Is that, is that fair to say? For sure, yeah, no. Um, there's a whole body of work there, including what, what I call heat maps. So Incoming is the immersive video made in collaboration with Ben Frost, the composer, and Trevor Tweeton, the cinematographer. And then uh, going solo, I make my own my own work uh, as a photographer. Um, the frame photos known as heat maps, which were published in a book called *The Castle* by yeah. published by Mac. And um, then there's this sort of intermediary work called *Grid Moria*, which is a durational photograph or a, a video that's sort of static, that has no narrative. It's a very interesting, well, it's a strange medium of form because it's 16 screens, separate screens, all playing exactly the same piece of footage, but at different intervals. So it's, yeah. if you think of it in terms of the musical perpetual canon or the round in music where each, each singer starts to sing the same piece of music in, at different intervals. And that's just the way our sort of structurally we, we edited this piece, which 
essentially is a portrait of a, of, of a very shameful refugee camp. And I'm speaking about the shame of us European citizens. It's yeah. uh, the, 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 the camp of Moria on the island of Lesbos in the Aegean Sea in Greece. Since being destroyed quite recently, burned by the refugees in protest. Yeah, extraordinary. And just to be clear about the form, it, it, it's moving images, or is it still images in the grid? Uh, no, it's a, it's a, it's a. I forget the length. It's about twelve or thirteen minutes of video footage. Um, but it's the camera has been placed on a robotic motion control arm. Yeah, that is panning. The camera itself is extremely super telescopic. So it's, it's two kilometers away on a, a facing hilltop, um, facing into this, shooting into this refugee camp, uh, a very narrow field of view. I think it's something harder to imagine if you're a photographer, 0 0.9 degrees of field, field of view, which is, if you think of the human eye would be more like, this is super pinpoint um, targeted. And um, so I mounted on a large uh, robotic, uh, robotic motion control arm that, that moves it on a X and Y axis slowly across that field of view, panning across and then moving. Uh, if you feel, if you imagine like a corn on the cob or a mosaic, it's sort of scanning yeah. the landscape. And, uh, and the reason for this is I'm trying to make my heat maps. I want to make a sort of very high resolution thermal panoramic wide angle field of views to get all of the perimeter architecture, all of the fences and loudspeakers and um, you know security gates and the tents themselves along with the cubicles and the WC you know the porta potties and all of the camp infrastructure including of course the refugees themselves lining up for lunch or yeah yeah or for whatever else um, the aspects of life and, and to gather all that into one place but that takes to make each heat map takes 40 minutes an hour so I took an extract of, of this primary raw material um, uh, um, from Moria, and I decided instead of making turning it into a print, to turn it into one of a 16 screen video grid, um, which we're presenting outside with grant assistance um, from the government. Um, and it's going to be a large LED screen, vast, I think it's something crazy, like 14 meters wide. Wow, um, okay. We couldn't even get the proper electricity for the grid. We had to we had to bring a generator in for that too. And it's yeah. quite an event, you know. This kind of technologies most artists don't get access to it regularly. <laughs> no, no. I, I was going to talk to you about that later. The, the, and and the idea of hate as well. Before, before we go into hate, as almost how you use it aesthetically. Um, in terms of incoming, I think we probably for those who who aren't aware of 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 just how much technology informs your work. Could you break down the sort of camera technology for incoming, you know, the camera as weapon, the camera as hate seeker? Just in, in layman's terms, if that's possible, yeah. could, could you break it down a little bit for us? Try to, yeah. Um, and, and that's very good, important, because a lot of the meaning of the work sort of comes out of this, this medium of, of this camera technology, as a, which I use as a kind of reflexively as a kind of prism to break open and, and try to unpack some ideas of the experience of refugees landing on European soil. And so the camera itself um, is, a, is, a, is not really designed at all for storytelling for professional photographers or for anybody uh, except for militaries and police forces. So it's a, it's a tool of a surveillance tool, an extremely powerful one. It can image human body heat from 30 kilometers or 18 miles day or night. So it's, it's seeing th thermic, thermographic, it's seeing heat. Um, you know, human body radiance, our, our, our life force is emanating from our bodies as heat. Um, and from the combustion engines of cars and buses and, you know, air conditioning condensers and all the sort of infrastructure of our cities and our, our, our ways of life is, can be imaged in a different way to the human eye. So this is invisible type of light. It's, it's heat itself. Heat yeah. is a form of, of light. Um, and we're, 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 we're registering, the camera's seeing medium wave infrared, which is quite hard to do. You have to cool the sensor down to minus 50 degrees Celsius. The sensor itself is made of cadmium telluride. The lenses are made of a rare earth mineral called germanium, which, which is a crystal that needs to be grown under lab conditions and then polished. 
And so the, the camera itself is more than a meter long. Uh, the diameter of the front element is about 30 centimeters wide and it's opaque, shiny green glass. So it's, well, not, it's not glass, it's germanium. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very strange looking thing that, and it makes the sound of a, of a freezer because when you plug it in, you have to cool that sensor down. And the, the, all this to say is that this camera was made by a multinational weapons company here in Europe. Um, and its primary purpose, its, its function, um, is designed for, for battlefield situational awareness, for insurgent detection, targeting, and tracking as part of a weapon. So it's regarded in terms of export as part of weapon system. It's regarded as a weapon itself. So um, they, det they detect the heat and then zone in on that. And used in conjunction yeah. with missile systems yeah, can, yeah. Or, or guns, it can actually be used to target and track. So there's the more classified version of the camera contains software elements that allow it to track insurgents from very far distance and use that to pinpoint them uh, using right. weapons, ballistic missiles. So um, two, qu two questions before you go any further. First, the first obvious one is how did you manage to get hold of one? Right, well, no, it's a funny story because in 2014, I was shown in, in a piece I made in Congo called The Enclave in London. And at the opening, um, Sophie Darlington came up to me. I'd never met her. Uh, she's one of the most talented wildlife um, videographers on the planet. Uh, she went, it turns out she went, to, she went to the same school as me up in Dublin. Her she skill, her superpower as a videographer, we, we all have different skills. And um, she's the long lens shooter. So she has this sort of uncanny intuition for which way the leopard will leap next and to almost, you know, predict that from, on very long lenses. Um, oh, what? Yeah. So she was dying to use this camera because it's more telescopic than anything she'd ever heard of. And not only that, it can see at night, of course. And so all kinds of interesting things happen with animals at night. Most of them predate at night. Um, so she begged BBC, as far as I understand, to, to let her use this camera. And they looked into it and they said, look, Sophie, this camera is just crazy. It's a, it not only is it very expensive to rent, but it's just impractical in the field. Um, it's very heavy, very glitchy. Um, simply, simply put, you know, they didn't want to um, unpack. You know, it's a total can of worms. Technically, they didn't they didn't feel that it was justified, and they were <laughs> probably right. <laughs> but she wanted. She she realized its potential as a medium, and she was very interested in my work at that time. And she said, "Look, Richard, you don't know me. My name's Sophie. Can we meet tomorrow for a cup of tea? You're busy with your opening, but I I have, I have to tell you about something." So I thought this is strange. I met her in Covent Garden the next day and she said, there's this camera, you have to know about it. And, and I think it's perfect for you. And I said, well, what is it? And she showed me footage and um, she said, I have an intro with the company who makes it, the weapons company, because they've been dying for a BBC Planet Earth to use it. <laughs> this is a small world. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And without that intro, of course, I'd never have made any. Sure, um, yeah. And, and so we went up, um, the, the company is actually their, their plant where they make that camera. They're, they're all over Europe. They make, you know, cruise missiles, assault helicopters and drones and all kinds of terrible things. Um, but the plant where they make that camera is, was up in uh, Basingstoke, I think, in Essex. So we went up in her car and she introduced me to the men in white suits with clipboards. And um, we went up on the roof and they set it up for me and it was a nice summer's day and rare event in the UK, obviously, and uh, it was a hot day, you know, and I looked, as soon as I saw the image, I thought, this is unusual, the image produced by the camera, and then I, I said, well, I'd, I'd like to zoom in, and so I tried to use it, I zoomed in, I, I couldn't even see with my eyes, but there were two builders working on a building site way the hell away, uh, and I zoomed in on them, and it, because it was a nice warm day, they had their tops off and their lovely big beer bellies, solar plexus, but they were welding. And well, the heat of the welding gun on the metal was reflected on their solar plexus, on the sweat of their... And I said, I've never seen anything like this. This is a kind of imagery I think of is absolutely remarkable. Um, yeah. So I told them I'd find a way to procure this thing. And, and that was the beginning of this, this crazy journey. Wow. So, so it's interesting that the images in incoming that you produce, there's a sort of rhythm and a texture and a sort of 
extraordinary sort of surface sort of texture. The texture was the thing that first of all got me. And that seems completely at odds with this big, unwieldy, glitchy thing that you described. So how difficult is it, you know, practically to use? Yeah, no, indeed. It's all dazzling texture and, and that's produced, uh, there's a lot of distortion. So the camera, not to get too technical, but the camera is cal can cal can, the camera produces a, a heat signature of relative temperature difference within a given frame. So whatever is relatively warm or relatively cooler within that frame uh, is indicated by being blacker or whiter, depending on whether you have it switched to black hot or white hot, which is a, a function you can switch in the operating system of the camera. Um, everything else that's cooler than that is goes the opposite direction in terms of tonality. But that can, it can only effectively image within 40 degrees Celsius a range, which you can calibrate. If it's a very hot day, you can calibrate the camera for, you know, basically what, you know, 40 degrees up and down from, from certain points that you calibrate on. If it's a cold day, you'll need to recalibrate. But anything beyond that <coughs> starts to peak out and blow out and dazzle and distort, creating all kinds of extraordinary artifacts that we found extremely expressive. Um, we wish to try to embrace that, the limits of that articulation. And the, the, the tonality is, it is well articulated, is very silky and beautiful. Yeah. Then yeah. It, it, there are like crests where it drops off and, and, and sort of blows out and becomes very expressive. Um, the second part of your question, what was it? Uh, just, I was just asking about the unwieldiness of the, of the thing compared to the poetry of the images, you know, but you kind yeah. of answered, you know, you kind of answered already. Well, just to answer that, you know, in more detail, the camera itself is 25 kilos, all of the peripherals, battery bricks, because it needs a lot of juice, uh, all the extra, there's a two computers required to, to run it, and all the cables and the Xbox controller. And then we put that on a steady cam because um, that's what Trevor Tweeten does best. He's a very dynamic, choreographed, moving through space. He's excellent at this sort of almost... In, in, intuitive kind of reading of a, of a situation um, with this enormous steady cam that's about must be about 30 kilos and all together it must come to about 75 80 kilos which is mounted on his person and then he walks through some very un, you know uh, unpredictable um, situations in burning refugee camps or in you know conflict situations in places that are very hostile environments with you know difficult terrain and he's yeah. able to sort of walk through spaces and come up with these very extraordinary haunting floating sort of gaze uh, scenes where you're you, you're engaging with the landscape in a very different way than a lot of photography videography would um, yeah yeah and the camera itself glitches out constantly it was a beast to use and it took us years to really get it to where we really understood it but even then it would stop working in the most inopportune moments yeah and and the notion of applying this high-end sort of military-grade technology as a, almost as an aesthetic in itself and towards this particular subject matter of, of, you know, the sort of the immigrant voyages now from, you know, from Africa, from Afghanistan, Syria. Is that, is the basic thinking behind that to get away as far as possible from straight photojournalism or documentary or, or to somehow challenge that received wisdom? I think it's to elevate it. Um, I felt fatigued already. In 2014, we were seeing a million souls a year landing on European shores by sea. A million. So, you know, in an island like Lesbos or, or some of these other islands, Chios and Lampedusa, Malta, you know, the, the number of boats per day was hundreds of boats. Extraordinary, yeah. Thousands Extraordinary. sometimes. And each boat would have 30 people plus on them. So the scale of it was extraordinary. But the media, you know, every photographers down there snapping away producing a very similar kind of image and I felt fatigued by that I wanted to find a way to do it differently to refresh it because it's important that those images exist but we need to actually look at them um, and if we if we stop seeing them I'm afraid the, the photography the, the imagery is failing to do its job so it's a, it's a it's a question of trying to elevate a form of storytelling and and to revive it renew it give it give it a little bit more muscle a bit more life a bit more oxygen but also I'd like to be a bit more complex in the imagery that I'm producing. Instead of just saying, here, 
I've seen this, I want you to see it. It's a picture of a refugee coming across the sea. I wanted to say all those things. This is a historically significant event unfolding. I witnessed it. I want you to see that too. That's what doc photojournalism does best, is photo reportage, documentary photography. It can change the world when you do it really well. But there's something inherently limited by that. And it's a very conservative orthodoxy, narrative orthodoxy, very sort of limited, reductive form of storytelling, in my opinion. Um, so I wanted to take a medium, very interested in photographic media, media uh, and technologies. Um, and I realized that this one that Sophie introduced me to was very sinister. It's made by this multinational weapons company to control people. And in thinking through aspects of the European refugee crisis, you know, the ways in which we, as European citizens, as, as, as the nations of Europe, as the EU, have failed the people seeking asylum on our shores, We've, you know, our countries have ratified the Geneva Conventions, the UN Convention on you know, Refugees in, in the early 50s as a, re as a response to uh, World War II when many of us would have been displaced and have to flee, flee violence, claiming asylum, turning into refugees without choice. Um, and, and that experience led us to, to, to enshrine into international law the human rights of the refugee um, and the asylum, the, the laws of asylum. And, and that's very important, uh, very, very important. And it's something that in recent years, perhaps because that memory is fading, um, those, those human rights are being, we're allowing them to erode. And so when we see a tidal wave of refugees fleeing conflict, mainly of our making, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, we, our duty to them, it's not simply a moral or ethical duty, it's a legal one. Um, we are not living up to that. And instead of, providing them a safe place and processing their asylum applications in due, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a quick and, you know, streamlined process and, and incorporate, you know, allowing them to integrate into our societies. Um, we've, we've put all our eggs into a different basket. We've put our resources into, into Frontex and into technologies to keep these people out. Yeah. It's yeah. Maintaining Fortress Europe and to building the walls higher and so this camera is, is one aspect of that. Um, it's designed specifically for long range insurgent detection um, and for also for search and rescue, but it's designed to enforce borders. Um, yeah. and, and so you could say it's very much an aspect of our failure. And uh, that just fascinated me. Immediately I realized this is a very resonant medium to, to use and to, to complicate the imagery and to to subvert it, really, yeah. Subvert the narrative. Subvert it, but also to yeah. load and uh, aggravate the imagery with a sort of a, a more problematic meaning. And, you know, to use a weapons technology, which has essentially, you know, it has sites for targeting, which we switched off, but it's used in that way. To use that to image refugees in, in you know, in a, in, in a crisis fleeing to our shores. That's, that's a difficult image for people. And that's good. Um, we're, we're trying to discomfort the viewer because the viewer, you and I, and all of us in Europe, we're partly responsible for this. We need to feel our complicity in these things. And we need to understand it instead of just give us a pat on the back. We need to really, you know, uh, allow the viewer to feel that in a more aggravated and, and uh, uh, way that's activated by the medium itself, which is somehow implicit or inherently related to some of these some of these problems that we've created and um you, you think the mediums inherent inherently related somehow to the problems absolutely it is in, in terms of representation or in terms of us getting inured to the imagery or? no in terms of its primary function so it's actually used on the on the borders to, to oh no your your thing I thought you meant photography generally as a <laughs> as oh. a medium yeah 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 no this particular oh no totally oh totally yeah 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 I get that. yeah yeah and and for people who haven't seen this uh, incoming I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in Ireland has it been shown in Ireland before no no it hasn't no. Uh, and it, you know it's a hard piece to show because the the audiovisual requirements are such high level that a lot of uh, requests to exhibit the work have, have had to reject because yeah, yeah. it's a very immersive environment, very, uh, the sound is extremely um, high end, should we say, and so are the projectors, and, and, but also the, 
poor Anna will vouch for this, uh, just making sure that the sound is absorbed correctly and the acoustics are perfect and the viewing conditions, there's no spilling ambient light. So no, there's been no showings of it in Ireland. The Barbican in London where we met yeah. in 2017 was the world premiere and it's shown in Germany twice, <clears throat> once in France, in Australia, uh, in SF MoMA and the National Gallery of Art in the US. And so it's had it's had a good run, but it, it's had, it's, yeah. it's hard to bring bring it home because, you know, I it's I don't know it's an it's a difficult piece to install and um, you know resources in the in Ireland in Irish museums are are less I don't know it's, they're more limited um, yeah yeah but I'm delighted to be able to bring it back to the Butler where where I'm oh, from brilliant yeah amazing and I got to say the Barbican I mean I should mean it's a great space but it's a challenging space the curve. And you made it sort of work. Uh, I mean, uh, the curtain, you know, the black attack curtains, the huge screens. I mean, it's quite, it was, the first time I saw it was quite overwhelming, I've got to say. It was very hard to, because you you're, you couldn't get that back far enough from it to sort of, so it was right there looming, you know. And and, the, and I can see what you mean. The sound is just integral to it. Yeah. Yeah, the Barbican is, is, a, is a wonderful curving, brutalist hallway. Uh, yeah. which it is a hallway though <laughs> it, well I think I forget what its original purpose was but yeah. I think it was meant to be a corridor but the acoustics are brutal it's yeah. all this concrete and it's vast uh, but we had this great projectors and we just scaled them up to eight meters wide each screen so it's it's hard to you can, as you say you can't you're totally confronted by it um, and Ben Frost and his sound design engineers worked very hard to to work the sound around every corner of that concrete and absorb it correctly. And yeah, yeah. it wasn't easy, but I no, I bet it wasn't. No, it's a challenging space. One of the things I remember being struck by was because I saw it a few times. Um, you kind of surrender to it's got a rhythm. It's got these internal rhythms. Um, even though there's, there's a lot of juxtaposition of imagery. I mean, you've got the people on the boats, obviously you've got the kids being hauled off. You've got some of that forensic, footage of the operating and you know the famous I mean it's quite disturbing and then you have these beautiful meditative passages I mean I, I even in my review I always go back to I mentioned the guy climbing off the bus and praying to Mecca in the middle of all this chaos so there is this quite a beautiful rhythm did you did you I mean with that camera did you shoot tons of footage and then a huge amount of editing we shot a lot um, and I think the rhythm partly emerges well, it was a, it was a, obviously the edit, but um, partly emerges. We we had a discovery with the camera early on that it was shooting in real time. It was shooting fifty frames per second, which means normal normal cinema would be twenty four frames per second. So okay. it's shooting double the speed. I think it was sixty frames per second. So I think it was yes, it was two and a bit, two and a half times the speed. And we didn't like the way it looked. It looked too realistic. Too, it looked like a video game or like a like a bad soap opera. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know that bad television has a really high frame rate and it makes you makes you feel ill, queasy. I that... didn't know it had a high frame rate, but that explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, this footage had that and we thought, well, let's reconform the frame rate to 24 frames a second. So we did that. And of course, we knew it would be a bit slower, but then it just slowed everything down. And so the, the rhythm of everyday gestures became very much epiphanized. Um, much more, uh, what's the word, I suppose, considered, seeming yeah. considered. Um, yeah, there's something very beautiful about that decision, something really mesmeric about that speed that you use it as. Yeah. But I also thought the rhythm of the sea maybe had something to do with it, but was that accidental? Well, it's Ben's, Ben Frost's um, sound composition is obviously very, uh, very much subliminally, um, uh, unless you're very conscious about sound, uh, creating a rhythm throughout and one of the main motifs in terms of the sound composition is is the sound of an aircraft an f-18 fighter jet landing on an aircraft carrier yeah high speed and just that wham and you know aircraft carriers are the most loud environments i've ever been you have to wear two or three layers of ear protection and so to record ben ben and i and trevor we were on an aircraft carrier in, in the persian gulf that was actively bombing sites islamic state sites in syria and iraq and so this was extraordinary um, 
and it's part of incoming, of course, it's a scene within it, but the sound of the jets landing returns and recurs. And you, unless you're listening for it, you may not actually identify it, but it sort of creates a rhythm and the sea as well. Um, and Ben composed the, each score for each screen separately, uh, which is interesting. So he, he let go of a unifying composition and he wrote a score for each distinct or discrete scene and then another score, didn't even think about that one, and another score. And then we pressed play on all, and there was all these accidents, happy accidents and distortions and surprises that emerged. Uh, yeah, must, must have created its own. And the, the other thing I, I thought afterwards was um, the actual heat itself is an extraordinary thing, isn't it? I mean, to actually forefront that and foreground that in the video the hate of the human body, the hate of all the technology that's going on around it. I mean, you talk about the plane landing on the ship. I mean, that was just like, whoa. You know, that was a real moment of rupture, wasn't it, in the whole thing? Mm -hmm. But the hate, I was, I was, I always remember that haunting scene where they're in the operating theatre and the hate of the hands on the cold body. I mean, that's, you know, that was taking us really somewhere else into the very heart of this. Mm -hmm. You know, the body, the human body and what's being done to it. For in sure. these extraordinary journeys, you know, yeah, the, and the, fragi the fragility and the endurance. That, uh, mm. I mean, that's what I thought was good because you do, you seldom see the that extraordinary the risk and the endurance that people do on these journeys. I mean, a still photograph really doesn't get that, mm. and the people piled up on these. I mean, it's extraordinary, visceral. I said somewhere that it was visceral and unreal. Somehow you you merge the two. Um, how much of that are you are you thinking tonally and textually all the time? Ton tonally and textually. Yeah, are you thinking constantly about these textures and tones? And because of the actual color palette, it's 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 pretty grey and it's monochrome to a degree. Yeah. But for some reason, the textures of the skin of the water they're all they're all heightened, aren't they? Totally, and 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 it's a great surprise working with the camera because we don't see. Ther in thermal, <laughs> obviously. So we're working with a medium that sees an invisible light, light spectrum and, and there are extraordinary surprises along the way. So you only see afterwards what it's produced? You get a little, the recorder has a tiny wee screen that's only three by four inches. And so a lot of the time it's very hard to see the details of what's, what's being captured. Um, and we got a lot better uh, after you know, some experience with the camera, we, we learned how the camera sees a bit, but there were still, no matter what you do, there's always surprises, especially with water. The heat currents in the water are very visible and the reflections off metal are very beautiful, very, like just a normal bit of metal that wouldn't, you wouldn't really think of as reflective turns into an absolute glowing mirror. You can yeah. see all kinds of things. And, but the most exciting and extraordinary was the corporeal body heat of these, this, the, our human biological essences revealed that you could see that structure of the, the veins underneath the skin and the you know the respiration the sort of the heat of our breath and the um the sweat coming down that you couldn't normally see very easily sort of black tears of hot yeah, sweat yeah. trying to cool the skin in hot days and and of course this is very important because you know we are there's a precarity to to us as a vulnerability of the human body especially when you're fleeing across a border putting your life at risk, crossing a sea. So a lot of people don't know how to swim. Uh, they get caught in water. They, 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 you know, they are hyperthermic. We can read that hypothermic, hypothermia indexically, and we have, that's in the film. And the revival of their bodies with, with warm hands, the, the, the emergency workers are trying to revive these hypothermia victims by rubbing heat back into their bodies with warm hands. And that's those traces of the handprints are left for a few seconds on the, yeah, yeah. On the towels that these bodies have been wrapped in so these this is all indexical stuff so yeah. we've, we've we've stepped away from or beyond aesthetic and metaphoric um, um communication with the image into a more forensic level that, that speaks yeah. indexically of just how hot and just how cold these these bodies are and the the interesting byproduct as well of of the reading the individual stripped of their of their individual appearance and replaced by this corporeal um, body heat, the glow, the radiant glow of the body. Interesting side product of this or, 
or sort of uh, important sort of um, thing to bear in mind or to remember is that it also anonymizes the individual. And when you're telling, telling stories about refugees crossing borders, you have to think about consent. Um, many of these refugees may not want their, technically according to our governments, they're illegal immigrants. And so they're technically breaking the law, although they're not because of re international refugee law. It's a very gray area. And a lot of them may not want to be identified. And so if you can tell their stories in a way that does not identify them, that anonymizes them, that preserves their identity, but still shows, universalizes in a way that shows some of their journeys, aspects of, of the, the, the struggle to survive, foregrounding their bodily mortality against the elements, the heat and the cold. Um, I think you're starting to tell the story in a more activated and respectful way. Yeah. yeah you, uh, for all that, you have inevitably had some criticism. Um, for the gay, you know, well, this, I mean, where do we, representation, the, representing the other, the, the anonymizing, the aestheticizing of suffering someone wrote about. How do you respond to those um, implied criticisms or sometimes overstated criticisms? Overt criticism. Yeah, no, yeah. grand, you know, like they have a great uh, proverb in Arabic, which doesn't really translate very well, but if you're holding a gun, don't be surprised if you get shot. <laughs> I'm making deeply political art and you know you're going to get attacked by people who have problems with your position or they want you to um, speak in a different way and a lot of these people you know they're perfectly entitled to go out and make their own film I'm not <laughs> my film does not uh, preclude somebody else making a film in a different way I just want to put that out there yeah there have been critics who you know have found you know they've taken a certain uh, broadside against the work, and that's perfectly fine. They're entitled to their opinion, and I've, you know, you know, it's absolutely normal for a powerful work of art to to raise the heckles. Um, and in a way, it's kind of the fact that it did is kind of showing that it's doing its doing its job. It would be a, more of a problem if nobody gave gave a hoot, you know. And it just, uh, I think time time will tell whether the work survives and. You know, we're now, what, four years since, since it opened. And let's see what happens in 20, 24 years. And I hope that, I hope that it still speaks to people. Perhaps it'll speak to people in a different way. But, uh, or maybe it'll be totally forgotten. You know, that's the real, <laughs> yeah. that's the real uh, test. Yeah. Is there inevitably a problematic with work as politically defined as yours entering the art world? Is there any kind of tension there? Um, is, is it that politically defined? It's not telling you... Well, it's politically, it's certainly politically charged. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I, I think art, the art space is a great place for... a great place for exploring, you know, uh, alternative ideas and unpacking the problems of, of our, established, our establishments and trying to critique. It's, it's one of the few places we have left that we can really critique deeply and attack um, our, own, our own way of life. And I, I think it always has been, a, you know, I think there's nothing new with that. Um, yeah, yeah. Would you think? Oh, there's nothing, there's certainly nothing new with it, but it's, yeah. I guess in the times we're living in, all these things have become much more emphasized. And I mean, the notion of white people representing black people, for instance, just to, just to horribly oversimplify that, yeah, it's become a much more um, a live issue than, for instance, when you were making the work, mm -hmm. giving Black was, Lives Matter and all that. It was then too, you know. And I, my response to that is simply that I'm actually representing white people's failure, I'm trying to hold this mirror up, this this mirror up against my own society and my myself included, to show people, you know, I think it's very important that people understand what's what's actually happening out there. Yeah. The things that I've seen, I want people to know that they're happening. This is documentary, evidential, testimonial footage of things that have actually happened um, that are almost newsworthy, that are certainly historically significant. And I'm trying to show the ways in which my society have failed these people. Therefore, it's a film by a white guy about, you know, a white problem, essentially, the failure of, of, a, of the EU to to welcome these people 
and to respect international refugee law. And it's by and large, it's for a, a Western audience. So it's by for and about Western issues. It's not pretending to be certainly not culturally appropriation. <laughs> No. Uh, it's, it's certainly not pretending to be speaking for these people. Um, no, that's one of the, that was one of the accusations thrown at you, um, which I find very surprising. Yeah. I mean, that was never there was never any intention to speak on behalf of anyone, except myself and yeah, except the world yeah. in which we live, perhaps, and and by extension, us European privileged. Yeah, I mean, the complicity is interesting, isn't it? That you know, we are you, you are drawing a line. You, you are. You are shining a light on that as well. I wonder what you felt about, since it's been made, particularly here in, in the UK, you know, the hostile environment, this, you know, there's a kind of war now with, um, with on, on, on even legal immigrants seem to be getting it at the minute, you know. It's, it's been ramped up, this, this, this narrative has been ramped up considerably. Um, it's terrifying. And it's yeah. actually terrifying and, and a little bit sort of excruciating to, you know, that these people are speaking on behalf of us. But um, that's, the way the, that's the way the world seems to be going. It, it's, it's become a very charged issue, very racialized issue. And that you mentioned the term Fortress Europe before, much more so now than even four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. now are you pessimistic? That's a good question. I, I, I think that... The rise of populisms really these dog whistles they are mainly predicated on the, the figure of the refugee and and uh, the, the that they're they going are, to come here and do harm somehow to make you feel this fear it's yeah. the politics of fear and yeah if, if a refugee can say things that make you feel fuck let's keep these people out let's uh i'm you know ultimately preying on your your fear and your anger which is exactly what social media does so Facebook and Instagram and all Twitter, they, the algorithm is looking to exacerbate and aggravate your fear and your anger uh, because that makes you click more. And every time you click, they get more, they can sell more data and you can make, they can profit more. So it's, it's specifically designed to, they figured out a way to, to get more clicks is to get people, is to, pin, to hit those buttons in your brain that work on fear and anger and rage and, you know, all those things. And so... They, the algorithm is, is basically very attracted to people who say outrageously angry things that incite a sense of fear in people. Yeah, yeah. And it picks those up and it gives them the, the soapbox. And so uh, as a result, it's polarizing our, our, our society. And so within a few months, a, a small village in Germany, which was a very peaceful, welcoming place until not long ago, all you need is one guy there saying twice a day, really, anti-immigrant things about how they're coming to take our wives or whatever crazy stuff no extraordinary yeah and that one guy will then convert the entire village and polarize the whole place and 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 that leads to, of course electing these populists who simply it's simply the will to power yeah they just want to be in control and once they get there and now they are they're doing crazy things telling lies the whole time and, and now I'm afraid in Britain, you really have to live with the reality of Brexit. This is, at least with Trump, we could get him out. I live in the States. At least we could get him out of office, you know? Yeah. I don't think you can turn, turn that back, unfortunately. Um, no, I, no. And I think that the whole, the whole pandemic has sort of drew our attention away from the ramifications of Brexit, which are happening. But there's also a lot of other stuff. I was listening to a program the other day about these sort of self-appointed sort of coastal vigilantes, these guys in places like Portsmouth and stuff who watch, who go out of their own volition in little groups and watch out for immigrant boats coming in and then go down and help make them unwelcome. I mean, it's just it's crazy. Kind of life, you know? <laughs> they, have them, they have them here in the States on the Mexican border. They call them the Minute Men. Yeah. They're well-armed, these guys. Are oh, I know, yeah, yeah. So, then, so within, within the European narrative now, you, you've got super fortress Britain, you know, and, and Italy is another place very hostile towards. I mean, some of the things that Salvini has said has been extraordinary. Yeah. That, blame, that blaming thing. It, it's not looking particularly good, is it really? Well, look, um, I, I was very inspired by, by our recent defeat of Donald Trump and, and his, his government here in the US and uh, totally energized and activated huge amounts of people that would never normally 
that were had given up on politics. And yeah, I think, yeah. I think you know, that is a hopeful byproduct, but it's not going to be an easy fight and it's not over because we have Republican parties literally stripping democracy away. They're dismantling it as we speak down in DC. They're trying to basically, you know, uh, disenfranchise US citizens. Um, and that's terrifying. And, and mm-hmm. let's just remember that a lot of this stuff starts with the figure of the refugee. Um, so the refugee elicits this crisis point for liberal democracy because we have human rights as citizens, right? Um, when a refugee arrives, they don't have the same human rights as us. So the, the universal rights of man is called into crisis. Yeah. And the populist politicians come in and they say, well, this is a crisis. These people are coming across our borders. And they, in doing so, they suspend all of our rights. And so when, when we allow for the erosion of the human rights of the refugee, we ultimately are calling, calling for the erosion of our own human rights. Totally. Yeah. And it's an inevitable slide from there, from liberal democracy into totalitarianism or authoritarianism or something that's certainly not democracy. Um, yeah. And we're seeing that happen so quickly. Very, it's very fast. Terrifying. Yeah. We have to be very mindful of that and protect it with, you know, after World War II, you know, we, we'd, we'd suffered a lot to, to establish social welfare states that, that have given us great peace and stability and great healthcare systems. And it's just going straight out the out the window like there's no funding for the arts in the uk more or less anymore it's all it's been stripped back no no uh, it's, it's it's crazy yeah, yeah. and um just to shift a, a few because I, i'm just keeping my eye on the time is i read somewhere and I, I i was quite confused do you apply the term conceptual documentary to your work or is that something the critics have done i think it was the new yorker online blog photo blog they they called it i think that was the first time they they coined that term and I, it's nothing to do with me. I'm just How do you feel about it? Conceptual documentary. I, yeah, maybe it's not the worst. No. I, I'm just an artist who likes to use photos in a documentary, in documentary forms. I guess my work is between, in the interstices between the documentary image and conceptual art, sorry, contemporary art, not necessarily conceptual. Because, you know, conceptual photography is a very dry, very specific, discipline sort of school and I think my my work is it probably doesn't deserve to be in that bracket because that's a it's a very cerebral and uh yeah I think that the not that my work isn't but it's uh it's very visceral my work as you as you said earlier and it it's it can be accessible to the layman it's not some sort of hermetically sealed um academic kind of media form of theoretically driven piece it's not that sort of stuff is it uh, well, there's the, there's theory behind it in terms yeah. of, but well, it's not foregrounded. Uh, <laughs> it, it's yeah. I never feel like I'm being sort of you know I've got to go away and sort of look up a few terms after I've seen your work. Exactly, it seems yeah. quite um, accessible, maybe, and 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 you know moving, which people don't often say. It is you know you you come away slightly altered, which is a good thing. Well, I think mm-hmm. that that can be upsetting to some of the cognoscenti in the art world because I mean, it's some sort of, sort of I don't know a lot of art it, I think they feel a little bit manipulated when they come away feeling an emotion feeling something moved but that's my intention is to make people feel something and I think that's one of the greatest powers of one of the only powers of being an artist is to actually make some other people feel something in a new and original and meaningful way um, yeah so we're are you at work on something as we speak, or are, are you too superstitious to speak about that? Or uh, <laughs> are you? Is there is there a follow up to this? Is what I'm asking. In my own yeah, I, I actually am. Uh, Hemingway once said, apparently, I, I think this might be an urban legend, but he once said, "Don't kill it on a bar stool." Uh, yeah. What's meant by that is that obviously, if you start to talk about your novel down over your daiquiri down at the bar, yeah, uh, you'll kill it. Um, and. <laughs> Uh, luckily, I've, I've actually we just released um, uh, some new work called under the title Trist Tropique, which I stole from the anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss, yeah, God, I remember that um, back in the college days. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't get the props he deserves, Levi Strauss. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So, is it is it on the same um, themes? Uh, so, I'm making it in the Brazilian Amazon, and uh, it's about. I'm trying to reveal extractive violence and environmental crimes and the processes 
um, that I'm seeing widespread. It's almost normal. It is entirely normalized. It's become, it's just become a total economy of um, environmental criminality. 99% of, of activities in the Amazon are, are illegal, um, according to a recent report. And, and to, to, to describe them with a camera is very difficult because, you know, environmental catastrophe is just way beyond the human form in terms of scale. Uh, and a lot of the processes take years, you know, they, you could see, see the aspects of them, but to, to really show those, to try to reveal them in a more meaningful way, I struggled, I have to say, I've been working on this project a year and a half, and uh, I guess I'm always fascinated by the limits of photo photographic storytelling. Um, once you hit that wall, I want to get past that wall, find a way, and I usually want to do it to try to leap over that wall, I look to the photographic technologies, the media, media of medium of photography. And in this case, I, I found um, the, satel the satellites in space are gathering multispectral imagery using very fancy cameras that's beamed back to Earth and is being used to analyze the, the deforestation, the, the scale, the rate, the velocity of deforestation in the Amazon and all across the world. And to, it, it's very helpful to show us by imaging um, narrow bandwidths of, of spectral reflectance data across the light spectrum from in the visible, but also in the invisible spectrum. Um, scientists, teams of scientists, many, many scientists are using this uh, data. They're crunching it through geographic information systems software, GIS software. It's a whole science. And it can tell us so many things about, about the health of the foliage, about the, what's happening on the ground, about the release of gases, about to predict, to model and to predict tipping points, to show ecocide. And that's difficult to do with a normal camera. Yeah. So I was like, how, how can I tap into this? How can I do it? And um, I actually found that, that those cameras are also being sold to farmers and mining companies to more profitably exploit the Amazon. So, so it's being used by the good guys who are trying to save the Amazon and to protect it. And it's also being used by the bad guys to, to you know, to extract, uh, of, you know, uh, to produce vast cattle ranches and uh, figure out draining patterns and more properly exploit the land, but also to pinpoint rare earth minerals, sometimes on indigenous territories. Uh, yeah. This is going on like mining companies, multinational mining companies are, are already laying stakes inside indigenous ancestral lands um, and are jostling to begin to mine them. And this is because Bolsonaro, Jair Bolsonaro, the government, the president of Brazil, has, is, is stripping back those rights that were enshrined in Brazilian law. It's a, it's a terrible tragedy. So I've been making the, with that camera, which I mount on a drone, I've been making these multispectral maps of sites of environmental crimes. Wow. Onward. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's extraordinary, the technology, how, how technology driven this all is. So... Given the given the what's going on at the minute, will you will you be able to get back to Kilkenny for the for the for the um, opening for the show? Not for the opening because it, I mean I could have done it, but it would be all sorts of quarantining, and I really need to be in Brazil because this is when the burn the burn season is beginning. And, okay. Uh, yeah. And so I am coming down for Arts Week, which is in early August, with with Ben Frost and Trevor Tweet, and, and obviously the lockdown has had some impact on how you work and what you've done. Oh yeah. Oh, no, look, have you been okay with it or was it a big adjustment to begin with you know i i have a wee cottage in county clare and where you know it's very remote it's a great place to escape the apocalypse but uh i went into a very dark place because i realized i don't think i can travel again and i've i've made this whole art practice around traveling and this sort of yeah the planes were were grounded like you go to the airports there were just dozens if not hundreds of of airplane just sitting there all mothballed and I was like wow the world is about to change <laughs> <laughs> and it was I went into quite a dark space and then I realized in, in oh, in, yeah staring at the wheelbarrow all alone you know talking to the birds <laughs> but then <laughs> then Bolsonaro opened the, the borders and I I was off like I think the next day I was in I think it was the same day he opened the border <laughs> I was in there making yeah. work and I'm glad I was able to because a lot's gone on in terms of environmental damage in the last well, is it is it in any way dangerous what you're doing in brazil it is yeah brazil yeah. brazil is full of guns and and uh 
they don't care who you are, some of these guys. And, and they're not, you know, they're sometimes carrying out, you know, crimes that they don't want recorded and you're there. Yeah. Uh, and the drone itself, it, it's, it's hungry for batteries. So it keeps coming back to be re recharged. So even if you're hiding, the drone they can keeps find you. They can yeah. find you. <laughs> Your own technology gives you away. I just came from a week ago, I was in Yanomami territory on the Venezuelan border. And there's a little town called Pelimiu, which is full of indigenous Yanomami people, villagers. And they were, they, they were under attack every night from Garimperos, illegal gold miners who have automatic weapons. And so they're, they go down the river and shoot into the camp. They, they fire tear gas in. And um, this all began about a week and a half ago. Um, and the indigenous, very, <laughs> they're warriors, the Yanomami. They don't mess around. They're not scared, you know, but they were really angry and they, or they've already killed just before I arrived three days before they'd killed three, three Garamperos uh, wow. in, in conflict. So, yeah, this is a conflict that that's really crucial because the Anamami hold mm -hmm. a piece of the Amazon that's the size of Portugal. And, and if we allow that to be encroached and at the moment, we have almost as many Anamami Garamperos as, as are the population of the indigenous who protect that rainforest. And if we allow that to continue, which is which is happening, because we're all so focused on the pandemic, and because Bolsonaro is just a is a, is encouraging this uh, environmental these environmental crimes, then I'm afraid that it's the it's game over for the Amazon. Yeah. So I think it's very important that 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 those stories are told. Brilliant. Well, that's a good place probably to end with your new stuff. Um, is that enough for you? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> A wonderful yeah. illumination of, of the work of Incoming the Great Moria and, and also very exciting to hear about the new body of work that you're addressing, uh, uh, Richard. Really cool. I really hope it encourages people to come to Kilkenny. Um, yeah, we hope to have Richard back in August um, and that'll be, we might have another chat session with you and Ben and Trevor at that time. Um, That'd be good, yeah. Yeah, it'd be really maybe good. I, maybe I can get over there, you never know. Oh, you're hey. very welcome. We'd, we'd love to have you over. I haven't been over. I haven't been over home at all since the whole thing kicked yeah. off. So the Butler Gallery has just moved to a new space. We've been working on a capital plan for many years, and we've now moved out of Kilkenny Castle, where we were for over forty years, to our own home. So the main gallery that Richard's piece is on is uh, this installation is challenging it in every which way it can. Or what we're trying to make it perfect and 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 and. Um, hold our head high with uh, past installations at major museums. So uh, we look forward to sharing that with them, um, with, with visitors to Ireland. I would say oh, it's really. mostly national and local, and, but we'll, um, the Grid Moria piece is just up for 10 days outdoors and that will be fantastic because that's going to be running to midnight at night. And Brilliant, yeah. People yeah. will really get I'd it. love to see that actually. Yeah, well, yeah. that's only for 10 days, but we'll have some, you know, we'll, we'll record some documentary work on that so that, um, that we can share that with you. Um, uh, but for now, I think we should we should finish. We can stick around for a minute if you like, um, but uh, for our audience, thank you all for joining us and do come and visit uh, the Butler Gallery in Kilkenny and uh, come visit the festival in August from the 6th to the 15th. Uh, there's so many wonderful experiences to have when you when you come here so um thank you very much both of you thank you sean thank you richard for your time today um and um we'll see you we'll see you in kilkenny um,